Well, our next speaker is the editorial vice president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, and he is the, uh, the man that really makes most things happen day to day at the Institute. But in addition to that, he writes a column for The Wanderer, and of course he's the author of Sing Like a Catholic, which is not on sale out front. But his book that is on sale out front is called Bourbon for Breakfast, Living Outside the Status Quo. He's here to tell you about it, Mr. Jeffrey Tucker. Thank you so much, Doug. You know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be in Las Vegas. It's my first time here, and uh, I'm, I'm amazed and impressed. Uh, yesterday, when we first got to town, uh, Doug and I went to lunch. We walked into the restaurant. The lady said, well, would you like to eat indoors or, or outdoors? And Doug said, well, I think we'd like to eat outdoors. So we sat down in this lovely French cafe uh, with blue skies, and uh, I thought, you know, the weather is really lovely in Las Vegas. And it took me five or ten minutes to realize that we were actually still indoors. <laughs> the city of illusions, I guess, is, is, is the idea. Now, Las Vegas is amazing. I mean, it's, it's to me, the final proof that uh, organized crime contributed a lot more to the well-being of this country than the federal government ever has. You know? <laughs> Um, so I hope I hope it'll be for the first of many more return trips. It's 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 wonderful wonderful to be here. I'm blogging to, blogging live about it on the Mises blog if you want to check it out. So the title of my talk is is Bourbon for Breakfast, and um, which is a peculiar name. I want to kind of give you some history of of how the title came about in the first place. It happened when I first got to Auburn some years ago that I was invited to a, a breakfast with Ward Allen. And it was about 7 a.m. Ward Allen is a remarkable man. He's sort of an aristocrat of the old Southern sort, an expert in Greek and Latin and Hebrew, and he's written a book on the King James Bible. And I don't know, to be around him is to be inspired by, I don't know, the, the scholarship and brilliance and manners of the old world. And you kind of get wrapped up. Tom Woods can confirm this. He kind of get wrapped up into his world very quickly. So he said to me, uh, Jeffrey, would you like some coffee? And I said, well, sure. I'd like some coffee. Then he said, there's a little bit of hesitation. And he said, would you like some bourbon in that coffee? I was kind of shaken there for a second, you know. I said, well, yes, I think so, yeah. So he got out his Dixie Dew and poured a splash of bourbon in the coffee. And I drank it. And I don't remember what we talked about after that. But, um, <laughs> but you know, the, the whole event kind of shattered some, I don't know, some preconceived notions I had about about, well, about everything, about what breakfast was and um, about what, what liquor, the role of liquor in civilized living and the aristocracy and all kind of confusing things ran through my head. Uh, and it, for me, it was, a, it was an interesting moment, not because it told me something new about liquor mainly, but because it told me how, how experiences like that can change the way you look at the world around you, and as the years have gone on, I've begun to think more and more about this whole topic of, in particular, things like, like, like bourbon and, and everything else, and, and how it is that the government has, and government policy, changes and distorts, really, the way we think about things. Um, I wrote an article the other day calling for a repeal of the, uh, the drinking age and uh, began to look at the, the history of our perceptions of, of, of alcohol you know, it turns out that um, in the 18th and 19th century, as far back as you look in all of human history, uh, there is a different perception towards wine and beer and liquor than we have now. And the reason we tend to associate it now with the sort of daring do, a party-like atmosphere, you know, the kids are uh, all hopped up about it and they binge drink and all these things, it largely results from prohibition. And... Um, I remember the first time I told my daughter that there was a time in, in American history where there was an attempt by the federal government to ban all uh, wine and beer and liquor uh, from sea to shining sea in this land of the free. Uh, she was just completely astounded. And if you look back at the history, it is, it is an amazing thing. I mean, the same generation that gave us the income tax and the Federal Reserve and direct election of senators and all these other harebrained ideas also gave us prohibition. And um, that lasted for many years until... Um, I guess Congress decided that uh, they were losing too much in tax revenue, 
um, for, by by attempting to ban it, it'd be better to have it sold and and uh, and loot people at at at, um, at the retail level. Um, and that's when we first saw the age limits on drinking. Before then, there was no such thing in the 19th century, 18th century. It would be inconceivable. I don't know how many of you know this. I just discovered this the other day because Mark Thornton told me about it, that the uh, father of our country, George Washington, was the largest distiller in all of North America in the 18th century. So, you yeah, know, times have changed. Um, so it's an example of how government policy affects the way we look at the world around us. And I'm afraid that this happens more often than we know. I consider my whole ideological enlightenment to be a, a, a series of small discoveries uh, about this very topic. And uh, um, part of my talk today, I would like to go through ten ten areas of life that have been particularly enlightening for me with a, a series of suggestions of how how uh, you might, you too might uh, gain some similar insight and, and help to fight the state. Now, um, several people have read my book and they said to me, well, it seems to me that this book just consists of um, a series of, of, of observations by a guy who's walking around with a um, ideological lenses on, you know, sort of Rothbardian, Austrian, you know, look at the world. And I thought about that later. I thought, is it really true that I have these lenses on? And I realized it's, it's not really true at all. I think to discover libertarianism and to discover the truths of economics and, and, um, and the truth about liberty is not so much to put on uh, particular lenses or glasses, rather it's to remove the blinders. It helps you see reality more clearly than you ever have before. So that's what I hope that the, the book will do. So let me go through ten areas that um, that I that I that I uh, think uh, that I would suggest you pursue as ways of either fighting the state or getting your own gaining your own enlightenment about a whole series of topics. I guess I'll start with the silliest one first, um, and it was the alternative title for my book, and the phrase is "Hack your shower head." Um, this, this whole insight came to me because um, I began to purchase a series of shower heads for my shower in hopes of, of getting a faster water flow. I went to a, a hotel somewhere where the shower head was blasting me with this hot water, and I thought, this is fantastic. I went home to my own shower, and it sort of dripped me out of the shower head in a pathetic way. I thought, this is ridiculous. So I went to, the, to um, Lowe's. And or one of these hardware stores to pick up a series of shower heads. I kept buying them, buying them, trying to find one that would blast me with lots of water. And it never really happened. I couldn't really figure out what the deal was. So I got curious and I began to take it apart and found that, that each one that I bought had this little stopper thing in it. You know, it was installed by the manufacturer to stop the water flow. Um, I was amazed by this. I thought, why, why, would a, why would a shower head... Um, when you go to the store, they're all marketed as being especially fantastic in the amount of water they, they pour on top of you, yet none of them really seem to work. But it turns out there's a government regulation about how much water can come out of a shower head. You know, who knew? Uh, this is all in the name of conserving water. You know, never mind that domestic water use uh, comprises less than 1% of the national water use, and that, that, that's including, you know, not just showers, but dishwashers, uh, clothes washers, and watering your lawn, and every other domestic water use you can think of. And it makes absolutely no difference in, in terms of water conservation, whether you have that little plug in your shower head or not. It's just preposterous. So what I did is I took it out to my garage, and I uh, pulled out my power drill and drilled the darn thing out of there. And, uh, and, and, uh, uh, put it back up and it worked. Yeah, so that's what I call hacking your shower head. And I strongly recommend it to all of you. <laughs> when I, <laughs> that's a way to work around the state, right? Don't let them, don't let them wreck your shower. So it turns out there was a company in Phoenix, actually, that show, that, that was selling shower heads that are easier to hack. You don't have to use a, you don't have to use a drill. You just reach in there with a screwdriver and pop it right out of there. It's fantastic. So I, I bought one of their shower heads. I got very curious about this topic. As a matter of fact, um, I went around measuring all the showers and you know how many gallons it'll pour out per minute. And I became a temporary expert on gallons per minute per shower head. And you know, I had all the data and everything. I've forgotten it now. But anyway, that was, the, that was my great weekend project with my kids. Um, uh, but anyway, this company was selling these shower heads that you can, you can easily hack. So I promoted them in a website and uh, an online article. And uh, 
they got lots of hits and had lots of sales. And next thing you know, about two weeks later, they got a letter from the federal government, <laughs> out of Consumer Product Safety, I don't know, whoever regulates this stuff, telling them to cease and, and desist. And the company, which had previously written me a letter of thank you, is now writing me a letter to beg me to take down the article or <laughs> unlink it. <laughs> so they're getting in trouble with the federal government. Yes, the wonderful things the feds do for us. Okay, moving on to number two, uh, which I'm calling Turn the Screw. Now, this concerns a much more serious topic, and it's the, uh, the heat of the water in your house, actually. Um, uh, I, I don't know where I was. I was somewhere. I was noticing that the water coming out of the faucet was, was extremely hot, and my own water in my own faucet was not that hot. I mean, it's the deal, you know? And um, at the time, there was all kind of health scares going on about uh, what happens if you have tepid water. You know, the, the germs aren't killed, and uh, your dishwasher, your, your dishes don't get that clean, your clothes don't get that clean, your own body is kind of, you know, you never quite get clean, you know. And so I began to kind of wonder, what, am I just living in tepid, disgusting, tepid water all the time? I mean, what can I do about this? And sure enough, I went to my hot water heater, and it was set at something like 110. Um, but there was a little screw that allowed you to change that. You have to sort of unbolt the thing or whatever. So when I changed it to 120, eh, it wasn't quite right, so I moved it to 130, it was getting better. Finally moved to something like 145, perfect, right? So blasting hot water is amazing to me. I thought, well, now what is the deal with these hot water heaters that they don't come preset at 145? Well, you guessed the answer. There's a government regulation on this. They have to be shipped at 110, you know. Moreover, if you're going to be licensed to install these things, you are not permitted to change them, even if the consumer begs you. So um, I tried this myself. I had a guy over repairing something in the house, and I said, say, can you, uh, can you fix my hot water heater so that it's hotter? He said, oh, no, not going there. That's not something I do, you know. I said, well, why is that? He said, well, yeah, I'll lose my license, you know. So there you go. This, look at your hot water heaters. Take a look and see what the government's done to you. Another favor that the Congress and the President have done and the bureaucracies have done for you. Okay, the third point. Um, I recommend that everybody visit a coin shop. Not enough people do this. In the coin shop, you find a marvelous look at the legacy of liberty through a certain perspective that you would otherwise not get. You find coins from all ages, and it turns out these coins are made of real stuff, real stuff that's valuable in a market, gold and silver and other things. And you get, you pick up the coins, you hold them, and you gain a perspective about what it means to be free. And you compare those coins with the money you have in your wallet, with the pictures of dead politicians on them, on uh, paper or whatever they're made out of, and you, and you get a short history of what's happened to us, uh, living from, going from a free society to a, a society that's preposterously despotic in every conceivable way. Um, uh, I always enjoy going into these shops and looking at uh, coins from, from all times and all ages and imagining just how much a freer country we would have been if we had retained a monetary system that was really linked to the individual citizen and, and his or her ability to, um, to change uh, paper for gold and, and gold for paper back and forth, to really get, have a, a profound sense of independence. So of course, if you have a state that's going to be taxing you all the time and running uh, huge deficits and running high debts, you have to change the money. There's no such thing as, for example, a Keynesian uh, state that's, that's on the gold standard. I mean, those things are completely incompatible. And even if an ideology of a country is not very friendly to freedom, so insofar as the money is sound and secure and it's of a good quality, you're going to be able to retain that freedom much more than you ever would. And so uh, I, I, would ar I argued in the book that uh, there's so many wonderful truths that you can find just by visiting a coin shop. Okay, number four. It concerns an article I wrote the other day and discussed in the book. Work for free. Now, this is some advice that I would give, in particular, young people. And uh, it's poignant today because of the very high unemployment rate of uh, new college graduates. You know, all over the country, you've got these people that have done everything right. They stayed in school, like the public service announcements used to tell us, stay in school, you know. They stayed in school, they got great grades, they spent gazillion dollars on, on their education, 
They've got high college debts uh, in excess of six figures, and they go out into the job market with a, with a degree in aerospace engineering or whatever it may ha- happen to be, and they can't find a job. And this is true for uh, as many as 35% of our new college graduates. Uh, the official data lists that some are closer to 20%, but if you include everybody who can't get a job, it's closer to 35%. It's a particular problem with, for students with, with debts right now because you know, the way the whole system works is that you have to start paying the debt off as soon as you get a job. But if you stay in school and get a second or third or fourth or fifth PhD, um, then you can continue to uh, prolong the period in which you don't have to pay the, uh, the pay off the debt. Um, if you accept a job uh, at Starbucks or Walmart or wherever the, the places that are hiring today, it doesn't give you enough income to both live and, and pay off your debt. So they're in a particular quandary. It's particularly dangerous since since in a very tight labor market, people are not interested in hiring a person just because they have a college degree. They're interested in actual real skills, things that you can do. And so they're looking for people. Uh, all enterprises are looking for people with some experience and some value to add to the life of the firm. Unfortunately, many young people have been told their whole lives that um, it's not necessary uh, that they, they get a job. The most important thing they can do is stay in school. You know? So they're in, in a terrible situation. So I, I recommend for all these people um, that they find some place that they can do volunteer work, whether it's a, an enterprise or a nonprofit organization or a church or some other kind of uh, situation to get, to get a job and just work for absolutely nothing and possibly live at home as long as your parents can stand, you to have, stand having you around. Um, and I would compare two situations, two cases in point. One was uh, at a clothing shop I worked at when I was about 16 years old. I remember the boss came by and told the, my fellow employee, uh, well, I'd like you to straighten those ties. And the, then the boss walked off and my fellow employee muttered under his breath, I'm not doing that for minimum wage, is what he said. Okay, this guy is a loser. Okay, but, um, and I compare that person to a, a, a man who volunteered his time working for Mises Org last year when our main webmaster was uh, off on his honeymoon. And it's the first and last time in his whole life that he was offline um, and wasn't unable to deal with the crisis we faced on the website. So I had a substitute come work for us and he manipulated fantastic amounts of software. He worked uh, 18 hour days. He, uh, he you know, dealt with uh, 75 different databases and did an absolutely brilliant job and submitted absolutely no invoice afterwards. Now, this was two years ago. Um, just last week, I got a phone call from, from a major university in the Northeast that was asking for a job recommendation for this, for this gentleman. And I gave him, as you can imagine, an over-to-the-top job recommendation. And he got the job immediately as a result of it. So you see in this very tight labor market, um, reputation and recommendations are worth everything, much more so than any degrees that you can throw around or any amount of time that you set spending is, is set uh, set in a classroom. So working for free is probably just a, a an excellent excellent advice for young people today. Okay, number five deals with a topic that I, I try not to discuss because. It consumes me entirely, and nobody can get a word in when the topic comes up, and that top topic is intellectual property. Um, in the name of property rights, for about the last hundred years or so, uh, the government has heavily regulated innovations with patents and uh, texts with copyrights. This, these represent a fantastic interve- intervention in the free market economy and have led to uh, innumerable disasters in so many industries, and these laws are getting tighter by the day. But at least in in the world of patents, there's hardly any workaround. But in the world of publishing, there is the possibility of of, uh, publishing without copyright at all, or at least not without conventional copyright. And the term that's being thrown around nowadays is creative commons. What this basically does is it takes advantage of the infinite reproducibility of texts, and uh, you publish within that framework, and that allows anybody to copy what you're doing, allows you to have complete ownership over your text, um, and also share that ownership rights with everybody in the world. 
I, I don't I don't even like to talk about the term ownership when it comes to things like ideas because it doesn't really make any sense. But the best free market way to publish is in Creative Commons. We're, we're getting rid of the government regulations altogether. The Mises Institute has embraced this model of publishing, and I believe it's one of the keys to the success of the organization over the last uh, ten years or so. Um, I would uh, strongly encourage any authors to use this model of publishing and to reject any contracts with publishers that are ta going to take away your rights. Um, but instead, either publish it yourself or go with a publisher that publishes in Creative Commons. And by the way, this is not incompatibil incompatible with profitability, as I think the Mises Institute has demonstrated. We're seeing ever more publishers embrace Creative Commons, but it, in this case, uh, mainstream publishers are a little bit behind the rest of us in this respect. Okay. Number six on my list of things, visit a courthouse. Um, even libertarians have, I think, a very naive view of the criminal justice system. I talk about this a little bit in uh, Bourbon for Breakfast. I spent uh, several days sitting in a courthouse in Auburn, Auburn, Alabama, and I was amazed at the uh, just how completely benign our so-called criminal class is today. Most of the people that were in the courthouse could be a... Uh, uh, Turned for, this is a criminal courthouse, could be turned loose on the streets immediately with no harm to society, actually quite a lot of benefit. Um, um, if you have the view that uh, our courts are filled with real criminals, I would encourage you to go to the courthouse and, and, and have a look at these, uh, these poor, pathetic souls. I saw so many people that were accused of things like stealing a ham sandwich from Walmart and uh, thereby having their license removed and fined hundreds and hundreds of dollars and basically their lives entirely wrecked. I mean, this is true for person after person after person in the courthouse. Uh, far from being criminals. Oh, my favorite, my favorite crime that was committed at the courthouse was, uh, of course, DUI was there, but um, lots of people that were drinking while driving. But, but uh, the, the biggest crime in Auburn, Alabama, is actually um, public intoxication. So what happened after they cracked down on DUI is people began to walk home from bars. Now they arrest you for that too. You know, so. so go to the courthouse if you if you think our criminal justice system is serving you. Uh, and see, uh, see who's there and see who's getting in trouble with these arrogant judges and their, uh, their outrages. Uh, number seven, um, I'm listing this not because I expect you to take, take me up on it, but just simply because it's something that, that I did, um, which is to go to jail. And it really did happen to me. Um, I went to jail for, um, for a time because I, I uh, inadvertently failed to pay a fine for a traffic ticket I received by uh, rolling through a stop sign about a block away from my house. I was arrested um, during a Sunday brunch at my house and taken to jail. And it was one of the most enlightening moments of my life. Actually, I got to know my inmates very well, nice folks all. Um, <laughs> but I experienced for the first time something that really intensified, I would say, and solidified my commitment to libertarian ideas. Namely, I began to understand for the first time what it means to be completely owned and controlled by the state. Uh, let's see if I can explain it. It's very different from being, for example, an animal. I have a new dog, and I can tell you the animal's uh, very well taken care of. Um, and my dog is. He's beloved and valued by all of us. Um, the j j people that are go to jail are not treated like animals. They're treated like something far less valuable than that. What happens to you in jail is a complete metaphysical transformation where you have absolutely no value to anybody, and anybody who does value has no control over your fate. Um, uh, I had no idea what time it was, for example, and it, you can't believe how important it is to just know things like what time it is. So I would holler out to the to the person, the warden or whatever, hey, uh, sir, can you tell me what time it is? And this blank look you know, would come over his face looking at me like, there seems to be some sort of flesh blob across the room that's making a strange noise at me, and I don't know why he's doing that. And then just go on. Very strange effect. Um, again, if you... Um, if you have a naive, naive view of jail, uh, you should go visit. I was astounded to discover that m the overwhelming majority of, of people in the, in the prison that, that I was temporarily in were there for ridiculous offenses, mostly uh, uh, petty theft and overwhelmingly drugs, you know, and overwhelmingly among those drugs, marijuana distribution and use. It's preposterous. Uh, I don't doubt that there are some people who should be in some sort of jail, and I wonder, uh, you know, what way the private sector could take care of that problem. But I can tell you that the the, the way the state is running, running its jails today, um, 
uh, is absolute despotism. The United States has the highest percentage of the population in prison of any country in the world today. We used to say that about Russia. It's not true of us. Okay, number eight. Now, I'm listing this under the category of just generally improving the culture. Now, I'm addressing this topic because the biggest complaint about the market, from both the left and the right, for as long as I can remember, and going as far back as you can look, is that it's unfriendly to the kind of culture that we, uh, that we want to have. You know, the left complains that there's not enough uh, art houses and... Uh, and, that, and uh, the kind of culture that I want, the right complains that the market uh, is destroying morality and aesthetics and all the rest of it. Well, you know, it turns out that, um, you know, these, the academics in Auburn, Alabama, have been complaining about this for years, that the, we, we lacked uh, a serious ballet and we lacked um, enough, enough uh, good restaurants to sell things like... Uh, uh, f food from all parts of the world and, and whole foods that, that uh, uh, greens like to eat. Well, it turns out this whole problem in Auburn has been completely solved, and guess how? Uh, just by a handful of entrepreneurs. You know, we had a, we had a, a person, in, uh, a, a young woman in her early 20s start a, start a, start a, start a ballet training school for, for young girls that's turned into a serious ballet. And uh, now we have that in Auburn, and it's a beautiful thing to see. And we have many wonderful new restaurants that have opened up with our growing economy and, and a new grocery store that sells all the kind of food that, uh, uh, that socialists like to eat. And I can think of no better role for a socialist in modern life than to support capitalist production by buying their goofy foods and silly, silly health items. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. So uh, the lesson of this one is if you want to improve the culture, go out and do something. Do something wonderful, but don't blame the market for it. Okay, number nine, I have listed as read old literature. Um, it's, it's, for many years, it's been one of my constant complaints that um, sometime after World War II, a whole series of great writers and novelists were sort of wiped off the map. Um, um, it's, it's like our literary culture just went through some sort of transformation and there's been a blank out about some fantastic pro-capitalistic novels that were written in the 1920s and 1930s, um, most especially by my favorite all-time author, Garrett Garrett. Uh, he wrote four great novels. How many of you in this room have read any of them? Yeah, okay, so just a few of you. And you highly recommend them, right? Do you like those novels, Garrett? Yeah. They're fantastic. Um, one of them is called The Cinder Buggy. Um, it's about the uh, transformation of, uh, of the country from steel to iron. Uh, another one's uh, called Harangue. It's about the experience of socialism in North Dakota. These are great novels in addition to being uh, uh, great economic uh, uh, tutorials in their own right. So read, read those books and keep them alive. I think that these books ought to be bestsellers. Okay, finally, as number 10, I've listed as just something very simple. Tell the truth. And here, I'd like to address a point that Mises often used to make. He spoke about ideas as being more powerful than armies. And I think we need to reflect on what that means. More powerful than armies, more powerful than guns. Why that might be the true, why that might be the case. You know, there are two kinds of goods in the world. Those which are scarce and subject to limits and have to be allocated through the price system and are subject to economic law. There's a second, a second kind of good that's out there, and that's the kind of good that's not scarce. It's infinitely reproducible. It can be replicated again and again without ever diminishing the quality of that first product. These are non-scarce goods. It's these non-scarce goods that do not need to be that do not, do not do need to be rationed through the price system. They can be um, constantly and forever uh, reproduced, and therefore they're the most powerful goods that we can ever deal in. They're the power, most powerful goods we can ever possess, and most powerful goods we can ever share. Uh, an example of of one of those goods might be, for example, fire. Leonard Reed used to give the example of fire because it can start with a small match or it can turn into a bonfire. It can burn down a whole city. Um, and it, it, can be, it can be shared and shared and shared again. It's the same thing with digital media, which is the great innovation in human history. Every time you send an email with an attachment, you've replicated that document. 
and that person who receives it can replicate it again, and it can happen millions of times and on into infinity. Um, that's the true magic of of ideas, is there infinite re- reproducibility. If you think about Jesus' own miracles, for example, so many of them involve taking scarce goods and turning them into infinitely available goods. I always like to think of the example of the loaves and the fishes. You know, the, uh, he's given a, given a luncheon talk, you know, like this one or something. People start to get hungry. They're starting to complain. And they say, hey, we got any food around here? It turns out one of the apostles has some loaves and fishes. And so Jesus does whatever he does and turns those small little scarce goods into uh, inf- infinitely reproducible enough to fill up everybody on loaves and fishes um, in the crowd. And after everybody was satisfied... There were some leftovers, and he did, again, whatever he does, and he turned it back into a scarce good and said, well, we better save those for later and tell the apostles to, to collect what's left and save them for later. So this is the miracle. But the miracle happens, that kind of miracle, is all around us in the world of ideas. This infinite reproducibility of ideas. So that, it's remarkable to think of it, if you tell the truth to just one person and plant an idea of liberty in his head, that may be all that you have to do in the whole of your life to do something magnificent and wonderful because that person can tell another person, or he can tell ten people, and so on and so on, and it can exponentially grow to sweep the entire world without anybody doing anything other than writing and talking or sharing emails or sharing links. That's an extraordinary thing. There's no army in the world that has that kind of power, that, that uh, the power of ideas has. And if you look at what's happening in the world today, you know, I, I marvel at the effects of digital media. Um, what Mises Org alone, uh, the website that I manage, has done for the ideas of liberty is extraordinary uh, in so many ways. I receive emails every day that are showing evidence of, of the way it's had this tremendous influence on culture. And just to be at this meeting, uh, Freedom Fest, and see all the people here from, uh, from all over the world and from all, every kind of demographic, how does this happen? It doesn't happen through guns. It doesn't happen through real goods that are scarce. It happens through the infinite reproducibility of ideas. And all of human history, in some way, can be looked at as a, as, as a struggle to find a way to share things more cheaply. When I prepared a paper for... Um, a conference we had in Salamanca. I looked at the history of the scribes. You know, you would, it would take 15 or 20 scribes to produce one book over the course of something like five years. And that book would be the most valuable thing that was owned by the monastery. And look what we can do now with digital media. We can do the work of all those people over many years in, in, a, in a flash of a second. With, with, uh, just by sharing links and sh- by sharing attachments. This is the real miracle that we have at our fingertips, and I encourage all of you to, to use it, to tell the truth, to share ideas, and eventually freedom will take over the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>